Ladies and gentlemen, my name is Total Biscuit. I'm here to ask and answer one simple question. WTF is Bioshock Infinite Burial at Sea, Episode 1. It's the long awaited DLC for Bioshock Infinite, and I think most of you know my opinion on Bioshock Infinite. At the time, it was relatively outspoken. I think these days it's something of a more popular opinion, but I've never really cared about that. Regardless, this is the sort of, I wouldn't even say alt history, alt universe version of Bioshock Infinite. As you will notice here, well, that is the new Elizabeth. Very much so. So this one takes place in Rapture, and I've started this video from the very beginning. That means you're not going to see any combat. You're not missing anything. The combat is exactly the same as what you are used to, and you basically experience the same kind of nonsense. You get, I believe, one or two plasmids that you do not get in Bioshock Infinite, and yes, they are called plasmids in this version as opposed to... What the hell were they called? Vigors? Yeah, that was the thing. And of course, it all takes place in Rapture. The first like 40 minutes, I would say, don't actually have any fighting in them whatsoever. They consist of kind of running around Rapture with Elizabeth trying to get some information. She tasks you with finding a missing girl. Then you get about maybe two hours of the sort of usual Bioshock experience, and that pretty much ends it. So I beat it, I think, two hours, 45 minutes. You could probably spend a little bit more time exploring looking for a couple of audio logs, but I believe I got most of them as we went through. So, let's talk about what the actual DLC provides, and then we'll do a comparison to the original. And we'll also talk about whether or not it's actually worth the $15 that they're asking for here. If you didn't buy the Season Pass, in which case, good on you, because so far you've been suckered with the ridiculous arena fighting thing, and then waiting God knows how many months for this, then... Obviously, you're going to be paying quite a bit for a relatively short experience. But of course, let me through the bloody door. Jeez. Couldn't even follow her through the door. There we go. Now it's rendered. So you get to go back to, Ra to Rapture. And of course, everyone's nostalgia is just flowing out right now. It's all over the walls. It's going to take a while to clean up. It's horrible. You shouldn't be doing that in public. You're embarrassing yourself. Anyway, yes, back to Rapture. And of course, fully redone in the improved engine. Looks a lot better. Great level of detail. Performance is rock solid, by the way. Really, really happy with it. Like, in this area, I'm up to something like 300 frames per second or something ridiculous like that. In combat, solid 120 to 150. Nothing to complain about whatsoever. The micro stutter that appears to have been present in Bioshock Infinite when it first came out seems to have gone on SLI now, so that's good. And also you don't have the really bad frame drops when you approach doors. I think I experienced one, but it wasn't anything intense. Obviously, the areas here are a little bit smaller, but one should bear in mind, of course, that it has loading screens just like the original, and Bioshock Infinite was not one congruous area. Also, I'd like to applaud it for actually letting you run ahead. You don't get stuck behind Elizabeth all that much at all in this, which is nice. Although it does also mean that Elizabeth kind of runs off on her own at times. Yes, there he is. Indeed. She runs off on her own at times, and it's a little bit weird because you can have conversations with her while she's clearly in another room, which is a little bit strange. Sometimes she'll follow you around, sometimes she'll just run in the direction that she wants to, and it's quite nice because you kind of know where you're going based on where Elizabeth's running off to, instead of having to rely on the nav arrow every five seconds, so that's pretty cool. Let me go and randomly explore some bits, but of course, all of this is kind of walled off, so it's really for show here. This bit's very, very linear. Then once you actually get into the main section of the game where combat is a factor, you do actually have a few options, which is nice. It reminds me of the old style of Bioshock, more so than Bioshock Infinite. You are given these sort of open areas with a bunch of different rooms and little back alleys and things that you can explore, and you'll be scavenging for coins, scavenging for audio logs, and of course scavenging for ammo for for your weapons. And this time around, that's actually very relevant. And it's a little strange. I can't really show you it right now because it won't let me bring up the weapons menu since I don't, I'm not in the combat section, but they let you carry more than two weapons in this version. But the game's not designed for that, clearly. Yeah, very clearly. So your sort of one through eight keys control your plasmids as usual, and you're able to switch between them at will. However, you are stuck with the two weapon system 
in the actual UI unless you hold down the E key, which pauses the game and brings up a radial menu which allows you to select different weapons. But you can only equip two at once, which is fiddly as hell. Now, it sounds okay until you realize that the actual ammo limits, limits on all the guns in Burial at Sea are way, way more strict than the ones in Bioshock Infinite. Also, Elizabeth never throws you guns, ever. So you are very frequently going to be running out of ammunition for your primary weapon, and instead of switching to your secondary, which is probably also empty, you could switch to one of three other weapons by holding down the E key, which then pauses, and then you sort of drag your mouse around, because obviously it was designed for a controller stick. And it's really, really fiddly. Yeah? Annoyingly so. But, on the other hand, it's quite nice to be able to use more than two weapons at once. Now, they brought back the Circus of Values, and they also brought back the Weapons Upgrade Ports. Admittedly, I only found one of them, and as far as I could tell, the only thing it let me do was upgrade the new weapon, which is the Radar Range, which is kind of this nasty little ray gun that will actually let you burn a splicer to death by holding down the button and focusing the beam on him, which is pretty cool. There's a couple of upgrades available for that, and aside from that, you can just buy ammo, so it's a little bit odd. Honestly, it's it's a little bit weird that they had that in there. Also, they put it about 10 minutes before the end of the game, so you're probably not going to use it anyway. You've also got gene mod upgrades. I, I've got to say, I didn't upgrade a single, and I do mean a single one, of the plasmids throughout the entire game. It seemed, honestly, a tad pointless, really. The money I used mostly just bought ammo because I wanted to keep up with the weapons that I liked using. I didn't want to switch to the guns that I didn't. Like, the carbine in this game I absolutely hate. It's a three-round burst weapon, and it doesn't do that much damage. I like the hand cannon. Obviously, I like the shoddy, but you can only carry eight rounds for the shotgun, so you're not going to be using it all that much. They've also put gear in this one as well. And the gear's quite interesting, I've got to say. I got this fantastic piece of gear. I'm not sure if it was in Infinite or not, but it actually alternated your shots between fire, ice, and electricity, which was fantastically fun. There's some pretty good stuff in there. They also added the sky rails back in, and the little jumpy grabby thingy, whatever they call that. The, you don't use them all that much, and frankly, you don't really need to. The, the combat is about as hard as you would expect. And as regards to new enemies, well, there's one, and that's the ice splicer. Everyone else is just a splicer with guns. There are no other splicers whatsoever, so the ones that jump on the walls, they're not there. It's just splicers with guns, yeah? And then you also get that ice splicer, which fires sort of uh, five ice bolts at a time. And he's kind of the big boss, well, mini boss dude, because he drops a lot of loot, and that's really about it. So, what would I say about the actual game itself and the DLC and whether it's worth it? I would say that the DLC is ultimately better than Bioshock Infinite was. Obviously, it's a smaller sample size, but they do the pacing a little bit better. They don't force you to run, well, kind of get stuck behind Elizabeth all the time. It's not as linear. They're not afraid to actually let you wander, which in itself is kind of wonderful. So there's lots of things to discover. The overall design of the levels is really solid. I like the fact that there's kind of a lack of sky rails because, again, I found those to be just, just a sort of mechanic that allowed for linear travel, and they kind of got rid of most of that. They're mostly just used for combat. Alright, so we're just having a look around here. That's really about it. So we're going to check these three stores, and it's always in the last one, so hey, that's the way of it. And also, for some reason, he all of the shopkeepers flat out ignore that you went back there, which is a little odd. That The world is painfully unaware of your existence, which... Is a little bit strange. But the combat is pretty much the same. Eh? It's, it's the same as you could expect. Elizabeth sort of hangs around and throws you Eve and also throws you health. Doesn't throw you guns this time around. It's pretty much about it. She uses most of the same lines from the previous games. Even the resurrection sequence is exactly the same. And all of the mechanics there are the same as well. If you're hoping for a big daddy, well, you're not going to be seeing them wandering around the place, I am afraid. But it's a nice little slice. It's a nice little slice of Rapture. It's done well. The ending is fantastic. I love the story. It's a really good mystery. Running around kind of at the start here is mostly just a nostalgia trip. Ultimately, there isn't really a lot of gameplay to be had here. They're just 
well, it really isn't any. And the gunplay, while being the same, at least you're fighting splicers this time around, which, as I've said before, makes a lot more sense. The area that you go into, it makes more sense that you're acting the way that you are, and you're kind of scrambling for survival as well, because the, gu the guns are artificially limited in the amount of ammo you can carry, so you are very much scrambling around. You never feel fully equipped, which is nice, because in Infinite, you were just drowning in everything. Even the original Bioshock, you were just drowning in everything. So it seems like they have finally learned their lesson there. And of course, it's visually extremely impressive. There's really no actual doubt about that. However, when it comes down to value, there's really not an awful lot of it here if you were looking for price performance. You know, this is basically about $5 an hour worth of game, which to me really encapsulates the problem with DLC. For the most part, it's just a little side story that doesn't take anywhere near as long, but costs more relative to the previous title. And that's absolutely the case here. But if you were looking for a little bit more Bioshock, or if you finished Bioshock Infinite like the original two, maybe were not so fond of Bioshock Infinite, then I think maybe you might get a little bit out of this, yeah? The nostalgia was good, I felt the exploration was good, the mechanics are solid even though they haven't really improved them in any way. The final weapon that you get, which you only have for about 20 minutes before the end of the game, is a little bit of fun to use. And you do get the freezing plasmid as well, which is nice to have, I missed that one. Being able to shatter them and do fun stuff like that is pretty cool. Plus there's a couple of puzzles that involve using that as well. You also do get reintroduced to characters, and I've got to say, the overall vibe of it is very, very creepy indeed, especially with anything regarding Cohen. And of course, once you get to the splicer area, everyone's saying a lot of creepy things. There's some nice little nods to the original there as well. A little bit of fan service, but a well done piece of fan service, and something that I think original Bioshock fans will certainly get something out of. But let's be entirely frank, it is not great value. It's not. You, know, you can beat it in less than three hours. If you blitz it, you can probably do it in two. You don't really need to explore all that much, although it's certainly helpful. The game is not particularly difficult, I've got to say. So that's my conclusion on it. Yeah, it's a decent piece of fun. I'm looking forward to part two because where it left off the story was a really nice cliffhanger. And I like what they did with the alt-universe Elizabeth and DeWitt. There's a lot of good stuff there, and it's nice to see, of course, Rapture be before the fall and some of the stuff that actually led up to it. There's some nice little tie-ins across the board. There's a little bit of weirdness with the way that they actually tie the infinite stuff in, just in the sense that, well, they really don't. <laughs> they just kind of throw it in there and say, yeah, so there's um, rifts and stuff, and that's, yeah, <laughs> you get the idea there. I believe it is actually an alt-universe rapture, it's not the original rapture, so I guess that kind of makes sense. But it is a little bit funky, and I'm wondering how they're going to tie all this timeline stuff together, because they did leave quite a lot unanswered by the end of the actual DLC itself. So that's it, you know, nice little slice of rapture. Some weird annoyances with the whole weapon switching, the fact that they clearly re didn't design Bioshock Infinite for that, so they sort of tagged it on at the last moment, it would seem, which resulted in it being a little bit wonky. They very much could have bound that to hotkeys, they decided not to, which is lazy, as far as I'm concerned, from the PC standpoint. But aside from that, it runs well, they haven't really improved the actual PC port and like the menu stuff in any way, but... It, it is what it is, you know? I, I, don't, I don't see them actually improving that anytime soon. So if you're bothered by the way that the menus were absolutely tiny in size, like here, for instance, that the UI doesn't properly scale and things like that, well, I'm afraid they didn't fix that, so there you go. That's it, folks. That is uh, Burial at Sea, currently available on PC, 360, PlayStation 3 for $15, or as part of your season pass. My name's been Total Biscuit. Thank you very much for watching, and I'll see you next time.